Um, how about Ted Green? How did you get to know Ted Green? I mean, that's. A, I mean, let me just define Ted Green for people that don't know. Ted Green wrote a book back in the seventies, I guess it was. It was called Chord Chemistry. Yeah, two books. Two books. Yeah, and and Chord Chemistry was this book of of chord shapes and patterns. There were thousands and thousands of them. And I remember, I think everybody thought that when you bought that book, you weren't a good guitar player unless you could play everything that was in that book. Right. So I tried to. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I've almost got my fingers untied, you know, from, from all that stuff. <laughs> but, but and a, and a lot of people did. You know, it was called Chord Chemistry. And it's a really, you know, if you if you just want to explore harmony and different sounds and voicings and everything like that, I mean, that's, that is the Bible. I mean, it's, it is the yeah. Bible. And and so he he lives today through the, the Ted Green um, Foundation and all of that. Um, but he was a great player, I was told. And anyway, uh, so that that's kind of my my. But your your relationship with Ted Green, well, tell us about that. Okay, well, Ted did uh, two books. One was Modern Chord Progressions, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I knew that Steve Freeman, who was a good friend of mine that was one of the teachers at GIT that had moved to Atlanta to start uh, a school that was a satellite version of GIT called GBW, which was a guitar video workshop. It was kind of like their summer session in Atlanta. It was a three months long with nothing but guitar players. Hmm. And so I called Steve and I said, hey, I'd like to study with Ted Green. So he gave me his number and I called him up and he answered. Uh, and I said, uh, hey, Ted, I'm friends of uh, Steve Freeman and he gave me your number, and uh, I've I've got your books, modern uh, chord. What is it? Modern chord progressions and chord chemistry. And he, first thing he says, he goes, "Oh, the chords of confusion, the book of chords of confusion." You know, and uh, really, <laughs> really super nice guy. But I mean, it was like you said. I would open the book, and I would see an E seven chord, and then I'd flip for about five pages, and it was all E sevens. You know, and. Uh, uh, and I think like what you said, too, is a very valid point with uh, opening the book and trying to learn all these chords. I think that's kind of the misconception of uh, what a lot of students do uh, and probably mostly in schools, but even in even outside of schools is, uh, you know, I, I look at music like a language. Mm -hmm. And if I was to convert the theory of music to the theory of language, it would be like going well, I need to learn English, so I'm going to get a dictionary and start from page one and memorize all words, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's exactly that's exactly right. And, I, you know, until yeah. you just said that, I hadn't really given it much thought, but that that's exactly what it's like. It's it's yeah. going to the go not only not only going to the dictionary, but going to a thesaurus. Yeah. You know, the whole nine yards and, and uh, the rhyming. I mean, that yeah, that that's a very, very good way to put it. So you called him up, he answered the phone, and he said the, the chords of confusion, and what happened from there? Um, I just went over, and, and we just kind of sat down, and he he played some stuff that was just great stuff, and and he just kind of showed me, you know, that you have these three notes, and in any combination, you can come up with a triad all over the neck, and, um, you know, if you add another note, whether it's a, a seventh or an extension, then you you've got more possibilities. And, and that was kind of how he got so many chords on there because they were all related to the E7, if you will. Right. Um, you know, uh, but it was just kind of a way. And the fingerings, I think, was what really helped was uh, the stretching those chords, which was also something Joe Diorio uh, was big in, you know, those chord stretches that I learned from him as well, you know, mm. to back on that. Um, you know, the other the other one that's uh, there's a couple of guys that are, are very popular players that you you interacted with. Um, you got Alan Holdsworth. Let's talk about Alan separately because he's a he isn't a he he's a separate, completely separate entity. What was the uh, what was that that guy like to I mean, I had a, a I, I once had a, a couple of Guinnesses with uh, with uh, Alan. Yeah, and I can tell you what he was like that way. But and I've I've watched his you know his instructional videos that he made back years and years ago. So what what is it what was it like to uh, how did you get to know Alan and what was the nature of your relationship with Alan? 
Well, Allen was definitely, like you said, it's it's a kind of a different ball game with Allen. Um, and uh, the thing I kind of did with Allen was, you know, my, my big thing was when I met guys, I would kind of introduce myself, obviously, and, you know, try to have a Guinness with them and pick their brains. And then, you know, I, I would say, hey, do you give lessons, you know? Right. And, um, but with Allen, it was actually at the, uh, in 86 in LA at the NAMM show. And he was actually working one of the booths and nobody was around. And he kind of was hiding back behind the, the banner. So I went back there with him and was just kind of talking to him. And he was real cool. And he kind of was like, really kind of looking around like that and you know like he was nervous in a way and you know he was kind of sharing about what he's doing and you know uh just different stuff like that it was almost like he was trying to teach me a different language but and he didn't really know how to get it across in a way and the thing with alan that happened was um i i was interacting with him and trying to you know figure out what he was doing of course i couldn't have done that just in an hour behind a, a banner, you know? Right. Uh, but when people heard that Alan was back there and they started uh, coming around, Alan kind of disappeared. He just, yeah. you know, he didn't like crowds. He didn't, you know, um, you know, so, so I didn't actually really get to study with Alan other than just to kind of hang out with them and, and talk to him and, and get a few ideas from him, you know, uh, I'm, I met Alan kind of the same way. It was at the NAM show, and uh, he used to have a guitar built by Carvin, yeah, uh, the, the company out there, and you know, and um, and he was just, you know, I walked past. I, I went to the NAM show for thirty years, you know, and mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, but he was just sitting there at the Carvin booth, like just sitting there, kind of like lost, you know, and in his own thoughts, and nobody was paying any attention to him. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I looked at him, I said, that's Alan Holsworth. You know, it's like, you know, the, the Greek God of guitar destruction, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. and uh, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was like, that, that's Alan Holsworth there. And he's just kind of hanging. And I walked up to him. I said, um, Hey, Alan, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> he, uh, you know, he has the, 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 uh, the accent, the uh, Irish English accent and all that. Scott, right. I don't know where the heck he was. And, um, I said, look, um, I said, I, you know, I don't want to be too much of a fanboy, but I, I know who you are. And I just, you're mesmerizing. Your, your playing is mesmerizing. I said, uh, I said, uh, I, I didn't know what to say to him, you know? And I, he, I said, um, you know, he said, well, he, and he, he cut me off. He said, meet me over at the Hilton bar for a Guinness. Huh? Oh, yeah. After the show, or except with the, with his, with his. So, you know, I, I think he said that to everybody. But I went over to Hilton bar afterwards, and I, I saw him there. So I went straight to the bar. I waited about 10 minutes because the place was packed. And I got two Guinnesses. And I walked up to him. And I said, here's that Guinness we talked about, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and back in those days, you know, there wasn't no, there wasn't any phones or cameras on phones. Um, the guy, a guy that worked for me had hit, used to take his camera, you know, his big SLR camera to the show and he snapped a picture. So I've got the picture with Alan, but it was the same, it was the same kind of thing, except we, we really didn't, didn't talk music, but, but um, you know, he was an amazing character so you just a couple of weeks ago um to change gears on you a little bit um larry carlton was in town right yeah you know at the velvet note which is a club that you and i um spend a pretty good bit of time you you in particular spent a lot of time there um and you've spent some time you know on stage you know with larry um in his clinics and and so forth and so on can you talk about you know your interactions with larry larry a little bit um, yeah, I think the first time I met Larry was, uh, when I first moved to Atlanta, which was about 1985. Um, and, um, you know, it was just, just kind of, he was, uh, I went to see a concert and I was outside and I caught him while he was get, getting on the tour bus and, uh, he stopped and we just talked and, you know, uh, for a little bit. Um, and then I have, uh, 
some good friends that that know Larry and Larry was in LA when I was out there. So uh, anytime I got a chance to play, so I was more of a fan at that point, um, you know, and then, and then as Larry was coming to Atlanta quite a bit, I was able to, you know, we, we had a lot of fr uh, different friends in common, like my friend Shane Terrio, who's uh, with the uh, hollow notes right now is um, good friends with Larry's son, who is uh, the bass player right uh, in, the in the band. Yeah. So, so we kind of had a mutual connection, you know, that would, um, you know, uh, kind of, kind of led me to not just be a, a, an outsider trying to, you know, bug him and stuff, you know, so I, I would joke with him and stuff like that. And I think he appreciated the fact that I wasn't just being a, a guitar hero, that I was being more of a silly Canadian, which I do very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know like the last time i mean i played with him on stage at, at the at the note a few years ago and then uh last time he was in town he he walked out the back door and he had his hoodie on yeah not hoodie but it, uh, a hood and i said hey who are you ah. he turns around and he goes i'm larry said, hey, who? <laughs> oh he goes, I remember you, <laughs> you know, so, so it was just kind of a, you know, a, a little bit of a mutual friendship that we had. And I, I was honored to play with him, you know, it was, you know, he's been a hero of a lot of, a, a lot of guitar players in general, you know. I know that you have a, a very special relationship with Mike Stern, um, you know, very special personal relationship with Mike. But you also have a musical relationship with, with Mike. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yes. Um, Mike has been a personal friend for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, he has stayed at my house um, uh, a, a few times uh, in his travels. And, um, you know, I stay with him when I go to New York and um, we know a lot of the same people like Shane and, and people like that. And, uh, um, Mike to me was probably the most inspirational person in my music career that I really never sat down and took a lesson with. Mm -hmm. you know? And and when I say that, it's, it's like, I never really paid for a lesson with Mike. Right. We would sit down, he always wanted to play and. You know, um, he would come into town and if he stayed at a hotel when he was traveling with uh, Weckl and uh, I can't remember who was on base at that time, he says, hey, man, let's play. You know, and I said, OK. And he said, well, look, what are you doing tomorrow morning? I don't have to leave till noon. You know, and usually <laughs> you do that to somebody you think, yeah, it didn't work out. You know, we got up from the hotel. I had to get on the bus. He calls me at eight o'clock. He says, hey, man, you want to play? And I was, yeah, I'm on my way. And I was in bed still, you know, so. <laughs> You know, and uh, went down there and we played. I mean, he's just that kind of kind of guy. Anybody that knows Mike knows he's a player like that. But my my personal relationship with him was he 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 helped me um, uh, get sober, if you will, mm -hmm. and, um, and was very very supportive in that because uh, you know that's a, that's a struggle for anybody that get, that goes through that kind of stuff. Sure, and, and to have someone like Mike help him, Mike's been there, you know, so. Um, you know, he's just, just a beautiful cat all the way around. You just, you know, he calls me and checks on me. And to me, that's like, Mike has been my hero. And for me, from where I came from to where I am now to have Mike call me and me call him is just, I, I feel like, you know, I'm in heaven. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 yeah. You know, it, yeah, I can see, I can see that, you know, it's interesting about him. We, he was just here in Atlanta at the Velvet Note. Mm -hmm. Um, and his playing has changed um, since the last couple of times that I've I've seen him. I think he's gotten a lot more, a little bit less bebop, you know, yeah. a little bit, a little bit less, and a little bit more just aggressive, assertive, uh, rock, a little more rock oriented. He's playing with uh, a couple of you know with, with tube amplifiers now because he used to play with the solid state amps, and and his tone has changed and his freight. I mean. I just heard him. I, I think I just think his playing has changed, and I think I think it's great. I think I, he's always been great. Yeah. I mean, am I crazy in that, or is that have you noticed it? Or 
Oh you know? no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He's you know, I mean, he's definitely a guy that thrives on trying to get better. You know, it's so interesting you say that because there's a there's a group of players I'm not going to mention any names that is basically I don't want to say they're phoning it in, but they're not trying to get better every day. They're still they're, they they're not they're not they're still in their minds are 15 16 years old you know like getting that next lick you know yeah and and then there are some guys out there Mike is one Mike Stern uh Robin Ford's another one I mean yeah. Robin's always looking for that that next blues lick if you know what I'm saying yeah you know there's a group of guys out there and you know and Mike's one of those guys I mean he just he's just my impression of him is he's just all of, all about the guitar well, listen, we're getting kind of close to the end of this today. So what, what we want to do with this uh, this this little series here, hopefully this will be the beginning of it, is um, do some, you know, three to five minute videos with you. Um, kind of, you know, there used to be a thing, you know, kind of in the style of this guy through your filter. In other words, okay, yeah. you know, when I sat down with uh, Joe DiOrio, you know, you grab a, grab a guitar and, you know, he would he would play you know his D minor or what or E minor you know you know these are the kinds of things that he would do you know yeah. or this was something that I don't know what what he played but this is what I got from it you know so yeah. when I think of when I think of Joe I think about that movement or that concept and right. you know these would be like two or three minute long and um so guys can kind of tap tap into tap into you know, what it was like for you to spend time with those guys or to be influenced by those guys. Yeah. Because I don't think, I don't think there's a bigger list anywhere on the planet than this one. I mean, I really don't. (laughs) Of luminary guitar players that people have worked with. I, I can't imagine. I'll be honest with you. I can't imagine. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. There's, there's a couple others that I forgot about like Jeff Berlin and, and, uh, John McLaughlin that I've had some experiences with too that are pretty good. Well, you know, and and you didn't even have Howard Roberts on this list. I had to remind you about Howard Roberts. Oh, going, right, yeah. You know, I was going, geez, you know. But uh, well, um, is there anything you want to add to this? Is there anything we? Is there any? Is there part of this that you uh, feel we we didn't cover that you'd like to like to add um, something or? I think the thing that I would encourage, especially guitar players, maybe younger guitar players, you know, is just to, you know, uh, I could share my own experiences on, on what I've had because I'm, you know, it's it's been an experience and the things that I've struggled with are not something I've read. It's my own personal things that I've been able to, you know, kind of almost get through. I'm not, not saying I'm I'm all the way through it, but things that like, you know, we talked about Mike and how humble he is, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of made me feel like, God, if he's that humble, you know, how how would I even have the audacity to have a (laughs) ego or anything, you know? So, so he taught me a lot about just the idea of uh, not so much the playing, but what it's like living as a musician, you know? Right. You know, so things like that. I think that's really valuable stuff. I mean, I really do. Yeah, because I mean, I, I was one of those type of people that would buy a book and think that I'd start from page one. And, you know, I, I, I'll i tell you a story I had with Jeff Berlin. Yeah, I want you to put that on hold for Jeff Berlin. <clears throat> yeah, Jeff Berlin. I was fortunate that when I was in L.A., I got to play guitar and comp chords uh, for Jeff Berlin when he would do his bass clinics. You know, Jeff Berlin's a bass player, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a pretty sought after bass player. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, so for me, it was an honor to be able to kind of back him on, on chords. Cause I could play jazz chords and he could do his thing. Uh, but I probably got more out of it than, than the bass players did. You know, one, one thing Jeff would talk about that stuck with me is that, you know, you got these guys that are all trying to play outside the key center and, you know, get this real hip stuff. And Jeff was kind of like, how are you going to play outside if you can't make it sound hip inside? And that just, that just, <laughs> you know is those those are what i call musical nuggets that i take with me you know it, it i don't need an hour for you to explain that to me just that little nugget there helps a lot you know you know 
I have a, I have a, just between, you know, you and me and anybody that watches us, if we don't edit it out is I have a real, um, fascination with the concept of outside playing. Yeah. There are some people that take you on a musical journey that diverts from the path on purpose. Yeah. And then they bring you back to the path. It's all on purpose. You know, in other words, imagine you're going for a hike and you're with somebody that is an experienced hiker and they see something very interesting over there. And they say, hey, you know what, let's let's go over there and check that out. And you go over there and you check that out. And you might have to get a few, th- you know, some roots and some trees and all that. And you go and you look at this thing and, wow, that's that's really cool. And you go back to the path. Yeah. And then you got the guy that is just out there willy-nilly all over the damn place. But it's definitely not on the path. Right. But it's not a, it's not a... It's not something where you go, oh yeah, that that's a really pretty thing, or what a what a cool idea that is. It's just Bonzo world, yeah, you know. And it's like you know, take taking a scale and moving it up a half step and playing the same pattern, and and uh, because it's out, is not the same thing as saying I'm going to do this, you know. And you and I both play with a guy you more than me, but with Randy Hexter. You know, Randy's a piano player for those people that don't know. And Randy will take you all over the place. But yeah. he's an ex- but he's an experienced guide as opposed to somebody who's just running amok. And we you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. R- Randy's got a gift of, of not only playing that stuff like that, but even doing counter rhythms between his left and right. But when you listen to it, it's not like you have to analyze it. You listen no. to it, wow, that's cool. I can feel that. Yeah. Yeah, because he's, he, it, it, this is, you know, my language, but, you know, he's an experienced guide. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, we're, we're putting it into this, you know, hiking guy. He's an experienced guide who, who wants to, who wants to show you things. Yeah. Not wants to scare the shit out of you by throwing you off the edge of the, you know, thing because they have no idea. I don't know what's down there, but you go down first, you know, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, right. Anyway, so I, what I wanted to say is that, um bill did write the book oh this is uh this is bill's book and um what's interesting because i know you as a player and as a friend and all of that and this book is all about um it's all about you know the standards of jazz guitar i mean the titles are in here all the things you are blue and green blues at cherokee 500 miles giant steps here's that rainy day uh you know and all of this stuff and um it's actually it's a, it's a it's a very good book, easy to understand, and I just thought I'd push that for you a little bit. I, I know that it's something you did like twenty years ago, yeah. But it's still it's still legit, you know. It's still it's still there. Solo jazz guitar, the complete chord melody method by Bill Hart. So you might want to check that out. And then your your website again is what is it? Uh, Bill Hart Music H A R T Bill Hart Music dot com. Well. You can learn more about Bill, and we're going to try to do um, get into all these different artists that he's been influenced by, worked with, studied from, friends with, and all of that uh, over the next several months. And um, I think it's going to be a cool thing. Yeah, yeah. It's so, be fun. so uh, anything else you want you want to add before we say goodbye, Bill? Uh, just uh, check in next week. We'll probably be doing this weekly. And <laughs> I look forward to it. And, you know, it'll be great. Yeah. Well, Bob Bakert with Bill Hart for Jazz Guitar Today the, on the day before Christmas Eve, 2022. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. See you later, Bill. Bye-bye. All right, see you, Bob. Thanks. Bye.